Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, bless us as we talk. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, Ellie has been teaching you sanctuary class. And she helped you build this beautiful model that's behind you there. She has a bit more to teach you about the sanctuary. And she'll do that uh, later, probably in November. But I'm going to be the teacher now for a while. Today we're going to talk about children. And their relation to the sanctuary. It was always God's purpose to save children. And when you go back to the story of Abraham being chosen, God gives the reason. It's because of the way that he would guide his children. And uh, later, when when Joseph's family was in Egypt. God began to call them by an interesting name. The children of Ammon were called Ammonites. The children of Moab were called Moabites. You had the Philistines and the Persians. But Israel was called the children of Israel. As if God wanted them to keep in mind that they were children. When God was going to lead them out of Egypt, that is when he began the process of sharing the sanctuary message with them. Turn your Bibles to Exodus 12. Exodus 12, we'll look at verse... 2023 For the Lord will pass through Egypt to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door will not allow the destroyer to come into your house and smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to your sons forever. So if we talk about the beginnings of the sanctuary service, it has two different beginnings. One beginning is the sacrifices from the time of Abel. And the other is this experience of the exodus from Egypt. These two come together as the beginning of the sanctuary. And what do, what do these verses say? They say that there's going to be a destroyer. He's going to go through the families. And where he sees the blood, he will not destroy. 
But where he doesn't see it, he will destroy. So this is the Passover. It was the first sanctuary command. Are you with me so far? Now look at verse 25. It shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he has promised that you shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children say to you, What do you mean by doing this? That you will say to them, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. He passed over the house of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshipped. What was God planning? This ritual would be done over and over each year. And children would see it. And they would become curious. And because they were curious, it would be easy to teach them. That's one of the laws of education. It's easy to teach someone who's curious. So what was the purpose of the sanctuary? To create curiosity in the children. So that it would be easy to teach them. The sanctuary was largely for children. Uh, turn to chapter 13, maybe one page ahead. 13, we'll look at verses 8 and 9. So I think we'll start in verse 6. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Children love group festivals. When families get together to eat, children have some of the happiest times. Do you remember times like that when you were young? Look at verse 7. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. There shall be no leavened bread seen with you. Neither shall there be any leaven anywhere in your house. Verse 8. And you shall show your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did to me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be a sign upon your hand for a memorial between your eyes. That the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. What was the purpose of the unleavened bread? Maybe it symbolized important things. But part of it was to create curiosity on the part of children. And when that happened, it'd be easy to teach them. That way God's law could be in your mouth as parents. I'm going to say that another way to you. You might be children. I mean, you might be parents someday. How, you, how will you teach your children about God and his, his ways? If 
you have rituals, things you do in your house, that you do repeatedly, that makes it easy to teach children. Because they will start to ask why. Why do you do it? And you can give a, a kind answer. In some of the places around here, if a child asks, why do we do that? The elders will be angry. Don't ask questions. You should do what you're told. This destroys the learning spirit. But God says, do it differently. He says, when they're curious, answer their questions. That's the purpose of the ritual. Some of you need to help Jonas go to bed at night. That's not it. She's he slept with her mind. Okay. I don't know what it is. But it's not too strange to me. I also go to sleep in my shoes. <laughs> Uh, look at chapter four, uh, verses 14 and 15. This is chapter 13, verse 14. It shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, Why are we doing this? That you shall say to him, By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt from the house of bondage. What was this about? When an animal has its when a mother animal has its first child, whether it's a cow or a horse or any other kind of animal, that firstborn animal belongs to God. It is dedicated to the sanctuary. That was the rule. You needed to sell it and give the money to the sanctuary. Or if you live nearby, you could just give the animal to the sanctuary. But, if, but if, there's no, if there's no way to sell it, then the verse just before this says you must break its neck. You must kill the animal by breaking its neck. When you kill an animal by, kill an animal by breaking its neck, you can't eat it. Because it hasn't been bled properly. So if you if it belongs to God, you can't just kill it and eat it. It's not for you. Now why was that done? That's the verses we're reading. The son says, Why are you doing this? And you explain to him the story of the Passover. How God spared the firstborn children. How because of blood that they were spared. And those that didn't have the blood were not spared. I hope you see this idea in several places. That when God invented the sanctuary, he was thinking especially of children. So now we fast forward a little bit in the story. But first, do you have any questions about this first idea? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, the children need something to make them curious. So now the children of Israel have left Egypt. 
They come up to Canaan. It's time to fight. But they don't want to fight. They say it's too hard. We're afraid. So God tells them you're going to have to wander in the wilderness. But before he says that, when they were complaining, they said, why did you lead us out of Egypt? We wish we were still slaves there. Now we're going to die here. And all our children are going to die in this wilderness. That was a terrible thing to say to God. He's saying, God, you're going to kill all of our little children. So God responded to that. When he sent them into the wilderness, he said, you're going to wander there for 40 years. All of you that are men old enough to fight are going to die in the wilderness. Except for Joshua and Caleb. Because they were faithful. But those children that you talked about, they are going to grow up. They're going to be healthy. And they're not going to die in the world. I'm going to lead them into Canaan. And that's what God did. The very children that they said are going to die in the wilderness are the same ones that conquered Jericho. So what am I saying? God has always been thinking about the children. He, he likes children for the same reason you do. When you find a man that is 40 years old, he's done many wicked things. He's done many selfish things. His heart is hardened by all those things he's done. But when you find a little child, he hasn't done so many wicked things. He hasn't acted so selfishly. So his heart is softer. It's easier to reach him. So God loves children. Now what did God do in the wilderness? Because he was raising all these children. And all their parents were dying. A very needy cat. Um, during the wilderness, God allowed the children to experience uh, troubles that they could see and understand as children. They saw their parents being thirsty. And then God fed them, uh, fed them from, he gave them water from a rock. My brain had a hard time to say water because the cat was eating the egg. And uh, God allowed them to be bitten by serpents. So that the children could see that when you trust in God's Savior, you're healed. All those experiences in the wilderness were lessons for the children. And then God talked to the children. Look at Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel 
chapter 20. Do you scale for your pet? And we're going to start at verse 7. I'm back for the sugar bowl. Then I said to them, Cast every man away the abominations of his eyes. Don't defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am Jehovah, your God. We're in verse 8 now. But they rebelled against me. They would not listen to me. They didn't cast away the idols. They didn't leave the idols behind them. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them. I will destroy them right there in the land of Egypt. Do you understand what you're reading? This is while Moses was uh, with his father-in-law in Midian. And God was speaking to Israel to get them ready. He was telling them to stop worshiping idols. And were they listening to him? Not really. They were still worshipping the Egyptian idols. Look at verse 10. Therefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt. And I brought them into the wilderness. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments. If you do these things, you can live by them. And I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they could know that I am the one that sets them apart as holy. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes. They despised my judgments. The ones that if you do them, you can live. And my Sabbath they greatly polluted. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them in the wilderness. I will consume them. Verse 14. But I wrought for my name's sake, that it should not be polluted before the heathen in whose sight I brought them out. Look at verse 18. But I said to their children in the wilderness, Do not walk in the statutes of your fathers. Don't observe their judgments. Don't use their idols to defile yourself. In verse 20, And hollow my Sabbaths. They shall be a sign between me and you. That you may know that I am the Lord your God. The next verse says that even the children rebel. And uh, it gives you an idea of how God works. What does God do when the church uh, is unfaithful to Him? Uh, what if the church in Bangladesh is unfaithful? 
As God sent fire and burned up the church in Bangladesh. No. But he speaks to the children. He says, don't be like your parents. He says, you're young. Your heart is a hearted. Do everything I told you to do. And if, if the generation also rebels, then he speaks to the grandchildren. This is, this is God's way of working. Do you have any questions about this? It's an important principle. You'll, you'll meet someone someday. They'll say the church is in rebellion. They'll say the church is in rebellion. Come with me, we'll start a new pure church. But he doesn't understand the principle. What does God do when the church is in rebellion? He speaks to the children. He says, don't live like your parents. Why doesn't God just start over? It's because the church is associated with his truth. So if he burned up the Seventh-day Adventists, what would the rest of the world think? They would think God doesn't like Seventh-day Adventism. They would think that we must be the wrong church. So what God does is he shows mercy to the rebels but he lets them die one at a time. That's what he did in the wilderness over 40 years. But they did all die. Except Joshua and Caleb. We have a question. So when you look at this picture, like about this, um, there are 40 years in the wilderness, some people actually picture God as like merciless. Like how can we show the picture of like how merciful he is? Well, I should say this in Bangla, but then I'll answer it. So, when we were in the world, 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 we were in the uh, some people always say like that that uh, Moses didn't do anything bad. He just did only one wrong thing. That why would he was like punished so heavily for this only one mistake? There are many people who have a hard time with the Old Testament stories. They have adopted a fake view of God. They think of him as an indulgent parent. The word indulgent. Like the parent who just gives the children whatever they ask for. But do you remember why Adam and Eve had to leave the garden? It was because of one sin. One sin carries a lot of guilt. Because it causes a lot of damage. 
In fact, everything that's wrong in the planet is because of that sin. So when God deals with Israel, He's training them. The sanctuary is for training. The sanctuary shows God's mercy. Because it's illustrated in the sacrifices. By looking, by looking forward to a savior, they showed that God would be merciful to them. But when you think about the two ways the sanctuary started, they have something in common. God has mercy, but only for those who are obedient. Is there mercy for Cain? No. He wasn't obedient. Without obedience, there can be no life. So God is training Israel. But in two stories that show the importance of obedience. In the story of the Exodus, they have to put blood on the side of the door. They have to stay indoors. They have to uh, stay dressed and keep their shoes on. Through the long night. They had to. If they don't follow all the directions, then the mercy isn't for them. It's a very important lesson. Someone says, oh, that's different than the New Testament. Look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We're looking at verse 13. Mr. Anil, would you read that for us? Romans 2, verse 13. Is that verse 13? It was. It sounded a bit long. So who is justified in that verse? That's what it says. It's the New Testament and the Old Testament. If God, if God lets one rebellious person into heaven, it won't be heaven anymore. So God must require uh, obedience. The easiest time to learn that is when you're a child. I've been thinking a lot in the last few months about the difference between Adventism and Islam. There are plenty of differences. But I'll tell you one that I've been thinking about today. In Adventism, you have satisfaction through self-control. If Eve decides not to eat from the tree, if she denies that desire, she has a happier life. If you choose not to drink alcohol, you have a better life. 
If you choose to follow God's ways, you have a better life in every way. Self-denial leads to a life that can be blessed by God. When you get to heaven, you will still have limits there. You will deny yourself because you know that God's ways are the ways of happiness. But in the Jenna, the, the paradise of Islam, there are rivers of non-alcoholic wine. There are many women virgins there for the men. There's everything you could want. Everything your mouth could want. Everything your flesh could want. It's like God is indulging you. It's just the opposite of the reality. It, I'll get you in just a minute. But in, in reality, self-denial is what leads to happiness. The, the way to happiness. So there's an angel with us now. This doesn't look like heaven to him. He maybe could enjoy being in some nature place in heaven. But he's right here to protect us. And if you ask him, are you happy? He will say yes. He's happy to be doing God's will. Because in God's will is the fullness of joy. As soon as we begin to become self-serving, we're having the same spirit that created sin and Lucifer. So childhood is the best time to learn these lessons. It's a time to learn the value of self-control. What do you think about these ideas? Suppose in our in our church, if we see a family where we know that they have they have children, but the parents they are not treating them okay, then how are do we have anything that we can do for them? I should say in Bangladesh. Well, if we see in the Bangladesh, if we see in the Bangladesh, if we see in the Bangladesh, if we see in the the problems in the world are huge. So when God wanted to start fixing them, He did it by using the flag method. He had one faithful man, Abraham. He didn't have Abraham stay with his family and try to get everyone to do better. Say to everyone, stop worshiping idols. If it had been one man, Abraham, against everyone, his influence would not have been dominant. He would have felt like he was losing. You might feel that way when you go to your own village. So God called Abraham to leave. And 
And then God began to bless Abraham. He gave him so much. And now the world began to look. And they could see it's a better way. There are even people around here who can see that we're happy people. They're thinking it's a better way. Look in your Bible. Oh, you have a question, or you had a question. I do. Yeah. Oh, Look at Deuteronomy chapter six. Deuteronomy chapter six. <laughs> We're going to start in verse 5. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you today will be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And talk about them when you sit in your house. And when when you are walking on the road. And when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. This is talking about children. But it's your own children. So what do you do about the family that's near you in church? You make sure that you and your own children are doing well. And you can preach about these principles. And you might even find a way to give some advice. But you have no authority over those children. You, You can't force them to do well. So we're going to start a school here. We'll have a school building eventually. Right now we're getting permission to build three fairly large buildings. I mean, each one is bigger than this one. And we'll put one of them right across the road. And we'll have one on the back side of our garden, near the trail I made up the hill. And one of them will be over uh, near our orchard. And probably when we get started, uh, you all will be teaching the children. And some of them might even live with us in those houses. Although most will probably live with their families. And these principles are so important to you. The children need to see that even though you're strict, that you're a pleasant person. Even though you require obedience, that you are honest and consistent. And this verse says that you want to talk about God's ways, not just one hour a day. Do it when you're walking and when you're working. So that it becomes really part of the children. Now, Islam has done something related to this. Five times a day, the children repeat some phrases in Arabic. In the Middle East, the children understand these phrases. Modo Asia kinto, a shamasto 
So by repeating it five times a day, they really impress themselves. But in this country, in many parts of Asia, they don't understand what they're saying. But you see the difference. In that situation, it's memory work. But in our situation, we're trying to create curiosity so that they can understand. In that case, you should not ask. In, in Islam, you should not be asking hard questions. But in our system, you should be asking. We like the question. I hope you're getting the idea. You know, you don't have to get an A in my classes to be a great teacher. If you love the students, and you really care to see them do well, if you believe in them, that's mostly what they need. Can I ask a question? About yes, you can ask a question. Say about this, uh, about the way it's written about this heaven of Muslim. Yes. Like you say that it said that there will be virgins um, and also they will uh, eat everything they want to eat and they will have uh, alcohol, non alcoholic uh, wines. So it's like it's like the perfect picture of what they are indulging themselves in in the earth. So it's like to them there is no difference between heaven and earth. It's like for them here they are earning it and there they're getting it for free. Yeah, that, that's the way someone said it. He said that it's a reward. So this is where it's like for God rewards you with all the things you desire. And uh, it almost sounds like Genesis, where Lucifer was speaking to Eve, and it says Eve saw that it was a tree to be desired and to make one wise. So right at the beginning, faith means following. Are you gonna translate any of this? Yes, I will. Right at the beginning, faith means following what God says instead of your desires. I'm a professional uh, so I start over and go to pieces? No, I'm taking, telling them what I started and I'm just okay. So, if you say that you have to say that you have to say that you have to non-alcoholic that you have to say 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 that you have to আমাদের ইচ্ছা মতন Milk and honey, that river that falls in between the country, in the Bible it says. But when the Bible uses the word, uh, yeah, it says milk and honey, that's what it says. This was an illustration of a land that was full of productivity. Where you have lots of milk, you must have lots of grass. And where you have lots of honey, you must have lots of flowers. So milk and honey was a symbol of natural wealth. 
তার মানে দুধ আর মধু হচ্ছে একটা দৃষ্টান্ত যেটা হচ্ছে প্রাকৃতিক যে ধনসম্পদগুলো আছে এগুলো দেখানো যায় God never taught them that they could indulge themselves without restrictions. কিন্তু ঈশ্বর কখনোই বলেন নাই যে তারা কোনো সীমা ছাড়া বা কোনো বাধা ছাড়া কোনো কিছুতে মুক্ত হতে পারে। He even talked about honey. তিনি এমন কি মধুনিও কথা বলেন। He said honey is good. তিনি বলেন মধু মিষ্টি। But do not use much of it. কিন্তু এটা খুব বেশি খেয়ে। So if you use much of it, it will throw up. তিনি বলেন যদি তুমি এটা বেশি খাও তাহলে তুমি এটা বন্ধ করে ফেলবে। So the principle of self-control has always been part of satisfying your desires. তাই নিজেকে নিয়ন্ত্রণ করা হচ্ছে তোমার জীবনের একটা অংশ সুতি। I was listening to the imam talk about this. আমি ইমামের কথা শুনতেছিলাম যে এটা নিয়ে কথা বলতেছিল। He said that the the male uh desire is for more than one woman. Male desires? The male sexual desires for more than one woman. ছেলেদের শারীরিক So God will in heaven provide many women for the men. But I say that God in Eden gave one wife to Adam. I assure you that Adam had more happiness with Eve than he would have had if he had had four wives. Because self-indulgence is not the key to happiness. Yeah, that's our that's part of our health message. Self-control is the key to proper satisfaction. So the Catholic Church says sex is evil. The Catholic Mondoli So the priest will not get married. And Islam says in Jannah that the men will have lots of ladies. But Adventism says that self-control is part of all true happiness. This is how you can how you can be satisfied without being injured. So I love Heidi. And when I spend time with her, I enjoy that. I began to have eyes for some other girl. Now there's a, a fight between principle and uh, indulgence. If I deny myself, I stay loyal to Heidi, I have the most happiness. But if I indulge myself, I might enjoy 10 minutes of sex. But now I'm going to have months and years of problems. And it will be hard for anyone to trust me in the future. And I will ruin Heidi's happiness. She won't even want to live anymore. So by indulging myself a little bit, I hurt many people. Do you understand what I'm saying? The self-indulgence is not the way to happiness. Self-control is the way to happiness. Because it prevents us from hurting each other. I talk too long. I hope you get it. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, prepare us. Teach us the way to live. Guide us by your spirit. 
Jesus. Amen.